Hello, is everyone out there? Um, I can't, I only see the panelists right now, so I hope we can see, you guys can all see us. I am Mary Ellen Ball. I am the CEO of Open Communities. I am beyond honored and grateful to be with this amazing panel tonight. We are here to talk about the history of fair housing. We are ending the fair housing month. Well, tomorrow is the end. So we wanted to kick it out with a beautiful bang to talk about how far we've come and how far we still need to go. So we rounded up the world's best experts on all things fair housing and then looking forward to things that we can start thinking about, about fair housing and equity moving forward. So um, I'm delighted to be here. I just wanna kick it off. We are Open Communities and um, it, I hope you know who we are. We're located in Evanston. We serve the entire North Shore. We are a HUD certified fair housing agency as well as providing free housing counseling for folks. Uh, just real quick, housing counseling is not therapy but it sounds like it is because we have amazing housing counselors that are certified through HUD to help folks with any housing concern or issue. A renter, a homeowner, someone wanting to become a homeowner, we are here for all of it as well as any fair housing, discrimination, complaints, investigations, we do that as well. So we've been very busy over the last 18 months with dealing with some COVID issues, as well as um, just the basic discrimination that we still see every day. So we've been busy. We live and breathe our mission. We have a great team and I'm thrilled to be here with the most dynamic panel to offer up some amazing um, insights for our group. Just a quick, some quick ground rules. This is going to be about an hour. We're going to try not to go too far after that. Dino Robinson is going to be our facilitator and I will um, introduce him in one minute. We are keeping things pretty contained because it's a huge group out there. So there is a Q&A uh, button down at the bottom of your screen. In there, you can submit any question. We're going to try to keep 20 minutes towards the end to address some of these questions. We know we're not coming close to answering everybody's question and getting everybody heard. So that just means we need to keep the conversation going. Reach out afterwards um, to any of us on the panel. You can reach out to open communities with questions. We are here. We are part of the community and we are thrilled. So without further ado, I want to introduce Dino Robinson. He's up here in my corner. He's the founder and the executive director of Shorefront. Is it Shorefront Legacy or just Shorefront? would help if I take it off mute, uh, Shorefront Legacy Center. That's what I thought. Um, and I will let him introduce our lovely panelists and I'm going to mute. So thank you everyone for being with us tonight. Thank you, Mary. And uh, thank you all for attending tonight. I think I see at the bottom about 39 participants coming in on this. So thank you for taking time out this evening to join in and listening with this uh, really good panel that I've had the pleasure of working with for multiple years and all of them bringing unique experiences and backgrounds into the profession. Um, again, my name is Dino Robinson. I'm a 40 year, 40 year resident of the Evanston community. And um, I am the founder and executive director of Shorefront and the Shorefront Legacy Center that documents the uh, uh, black experience on Chicago suburban North Shore. Now I would love to introduce first, um, Reverend Michael Neighbors and, um, Reverend Neighbors, if you can take it away and introduce yourself and tell us a bit about what you do. Uh, thank you, Dino, and good evening to everyone. We're so happy to have this audience um, tonight to talk about this very timely and important subject uh, regarding housing. Um, I am Michael Neighbors, and I have been in Evanston for the past six years. I serve as pastor of Second Baptist Church in Evanston and also as president of the Evanston North Shore National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Um, I have held similar positions in different parts of the country. Um, I was president of the Princeton branch of the NAACP as a very young pastor um, 35 years ago. Um, also went on to serve as president of the Trenton branch of the NAACP um, in New Jersey, and also a board member of the Detroit NAACP, um, which 
is the largest branch in the country with over 10,000 members. I think it's important to share that because in the summer of 2016, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund filed a class action lawsuit challenging uh, the racially discriminatory and illegal tax foreclosures that uh, plagued African-American communities in Detroit throughout Wayne County as it related to housing. So I'm happy to have some experience. Um, I'm certainly not an expert um, as we were introduced by Mary Ellen, but I'm certainly proud to be uh, a part of this August uh, panel discussion tonight. Thank you, Dino. Thank you, Reverend Neighbors. And of course, I would love to pass the baton to our uh, Evanston's Fifth Ward Alderman, uh, finishing up her term, her tenure, um, Alderman uh, Robin Rue Simmons. Um, thank you, Dino. And thank you, Olson Communities, for um, creating this space and for many years of housing advocacy and fair housing work. Um, again, I'm Robin. I am a native Fifth Ward resident, born and raised, and I serve here currently. I am retiring on May 10th, um, but I ha have been a long time um, fair housing advocate and focused on um, economic inclusion and uh, racial justice. And that has led us to um, the introduction and passing of our reparations here in Evanston. So I'm an entrepreneur and an advocate, not an expert yet, still learning along with uh, my colleagues, Dr. Neighbor and Dino. Very happy to be here. Thank you so much, Alderman Simmons. And I must say too that, you know, in all your work that you were doing, we've been recently appointed to the National African-American Reparations Commission. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. So congratulations to you and great work that you're doing. Thank so you. with that, uh, we have a series of questions that we're going to pose to this uh, uh, committee. And uh, just so um, a further note that we'll have one other panelist that will be joining us uh, hopefully shortly, uh, uh, Courtney Jones. And um, uh, once he gets on, we'll kind of pause and have him introduce himself as well. So again, thank you, panelists. And um, the first question I have, I'm actually going to direct this to uh, Reverend Neighbors. Um, kind of give us a little historical context. Uh, during the civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s, um, the object of work was focused on fair housing. Can you share some overview of what were some of the main concerns um, were at that time? You know, conditions, neighborhoods, access to loans, redlining. Dino, you know, thank you for that question. And um, and let me let me begin by saying that. Um, I, I'd certainly like to do my best to talk about what that movement was like in the 50s and 60s starting there, but it's impossible to do that because the movement that began in the 50s and 60s um, to talk about um, civil rights related to housing was built on a foundation from generations before and from decades before. The history of, um, of housing and discrimination against Blacks in the United States is very, very old. Um, it, it's important for you to know that if we put historical lenses on the first form of uh, discrimination related to housing for people of color in the United States uh, who were Black would actually be during the antebellum South and, and slavery. Um, never owned our own homes, uh, absolutely living in slave quarters, and then during the reconstruction years when our people began to build their own communities, we know that many of those communities were burned down post reconstruction, uh, beginning in the 1870s. So we have to we have to build on all of that. Um, going into the 1900s, I, I would say that one very, very important um, case about fair housing occurred in Detroit uh, with a case involving a black doctor named Osane Sweet. Osane Sweet bought a home in a white neighborhood in, in Detroit. And when he went into the home with his family, um, a white crowd gathered um, because they did not want them in, in, in the home. And the reason why is because the United States government, including Detroit, had created what were called restrictive covenants, which were stipulations uh, written into property deeds beginning in 1917 to control who could live on land that was connected to the deed of the property. You know, we would later come to talk about um, these as, as redlining, a form of discrimination trying to direct people of color away from certain areas. 
areas. The United States government through the Federal Housing Administration and the Homeowners Loan Association discriminated against black people by granting low interest loans and mortgages to white um, homeowners themselves. And uh, you know, this was across the board. Even the armed forces discriminated with their use of the GI Bill. So every veteran coming back from World War II had an opportunity to get a, a low interest loan to purchase a home. And in the Detroit area, for instance, um, they were able to purchase homes, but only in one particular neighborhood. And the Federal Housing Administration made um, home developers build a eight foot wall to separate the black neighborhood where veterans uh, were able to purchase homes from everybody else in, um, in the Detroit area. So going back to Osain Sweet, so in 1925, he purchased the home, a crowd gathered, there were shots that rang out and Osain Sweet had friends in his home and uh, a white person was actually shot. And uh, Osain Sweet and others were arrested. There was a big trial in 1925 and all of the blacks were acquitted when the NAACP actually brought in a renowned uh, lawyer to defend them. His name was Clarence Darrow. So at the time, Clarence Darrow was, of course, maybe the most popular and renowned defense attorney in the United States, especially popular for uh, Inherit the Wind, the movie that starred, you know, Spencer, uh, Spencer Tracy that had to do with, uh, had to do with science. And so when I think about um, the history history of housing discrimination in the 50s and 60s, they inherited everything that went before them with regard to redlining, with regard to the Federal Housing Administrator, uh, Administration, the Homeowners Loan Association. It was so bad until in 1966, Martin Luther King Jr. was approached by a delegation of 40 different civil rights organizations in Chicago. And uh, they were literally begging for him to come and to try to fight against uh, discriminatory housing practices in the city of Chicago. He came out to Chicago and actually lived in a certain neighborhood for one year as a commitment to fight against discrimination. Uh, when it was all over and he was back in Atlanta, he said that it was the greatest sham that he had ever experienced when Richard Daly made the promise of trying to come up with new ways of uh, creating equal housing for Blacks in, in Chicago. So, so King said that did not happen. And you may know that he faced his largest um, confrontation in any northern city in Chicago when he was actually hit by rocks at Marquette Park uh, during a demonstration all that was about housing. So that's what it was like in the 1950s and 60s. So I just wanted to, to give a little bit of history and to share what uh, people of color face. And I want to end by saying, I want to make it very clear, the United States government was responsible for creating discriminatory practices against Black people and brown people and poor people as it related to housing in the United States. And that discrimination occurred because of racism, no question about it. Thank you so much for those comments, Reverend Neighbors. I also want to introduce um, um, Represent Representative uh, Will Guzzardi. Um, please, if you can introduce yourself. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here with you all this evening. Um, my name is Will Guzzardi. I'm the state representative from the 39th district, which is all in the city of Chicago. I'm not up uh, in the lake shore, but um, I'm so happy to be here with you this evening. Um, I'm the chair of the housing committee, the newly formed housing committee in the Illinois General Assembly in the state house. I've been a legislator since 2015, serving my fourth term right now. And so, you know, I'm, uh, I'm here. I certainly don't have the depth of expertise or historical understanding that the Reverend does or the others here on this call, but I'm, I'm here and we'll chime in a little later on to share some of what's going on at the state level as pertains to housing discrimination, fair housing, and and affordable housing questions more broadly. So thank you all for, for having me this evening. And I see Courtney's with us as well too. I see you there with a long one too. Absolutely, and welcome Courtney. Um, uh, please uh, take this uh, moment of time to uh, Mr. Jones to uh, introduce yourself to the audience. Yes, I don't, can you guys hear me? Awesome, uh, Courtney Jones, Executive Director of the Black Coalition for Housing. Um, and co-owner of Chicago Realty Group uh, with my wife, Sanina Ellison. Thank you and welcome to this uh, committee. Glad to have you here. Um, Thank you. Um, 
the, the the first question that uh, um, that uh, Reverend Neighbors uh, um, great went to great lengths to uh, describe. I'm not going to make sure that if anybody else wants to add to that uh, before we on, move on to the next uh, question. And if not, I will move on. And hearing nothing, I will move on. And actually, Courtney, because you came, you know, you're you're on right now. You have the last speaker. I have a question uh, that's more geared toward you. Okay. Um, and also, Representative Guzardi, if you'd like to chime in on this as well. Uh, for the Chicago metro area and suburban North Shore, there are multiple efforts in encouraging integration with these communities. However, with these efforts, there were mixed results, concerns, and pushback. Uh, can you kind of share maybe some pinpoints and things of what some of the pushbacks may have been, concerns across the board with um, you know, community residents, real estate agencies, banks, um, overall attitude? Uh, that played a part in discriminatory practices in housing. Oh yes, um, it would be my pleasure, um, and I just want to kind of echo the sentiments of Reverend. Um, you, you nailed it. I mean, you all of the points that you touched on just kind of leads right into what I would share, which is about the restrictive covenants piece. I mean, when you come out of the post-traumatic stress of of realizing that there were laws that said it would be illegal for you to live somewhere, that's a big burden to walk with right? That's one. But then two, when you learn a little bit about redlining and the structure through construction and how highways and train tracks separate amenities and infrastructure of communities from certain types of people, you know, that in and of itself leads to post-traumatic stress, right? It leads to folks living in poor living conditions and having to accept that and having to make do with less. Then you go into things like um, loan level price adjustments, right? So now you have a situation where a government agency comes out, recognizes that discrim discrimination is alive and well, and tries to combat it with a program to help increase Black home ownership. But then when it gets in the bank's hands, they decide to add more layers to it that because you live in a Black neighborhood, that automatically you're gonna pay more for the same loan. So if I were to tell you a $200,000 FHA loan would cost a black family traditionally in 2012 to date $45,000 more, what would that family be able to do with that kind of wealth? That's, that's two. Then when you get into things like the three, which is structural. So we have realtors who decide where the person who comes to them eager to find a property, they start determining what neighborhoods would be best for Rep. Will or then um, Alderman Simmons, myself, like, oh, you wouldn't want to live there, Courtney. You would you'd be better suited over here. So those are the passive aggressive subtle things that most folks don't even realize, but leads to the log jamming of pushing people in certain communities. I'll just add briefly to say, I mean, all of that is um, absolutely right and, and very well put. And, you know, I think also that as, um, you know, federal law changed and discrimination on the basis of race explicitly was made illegal in law, um, policymakers found other ways to cloak racism, right? Um, and I think, you know, at the moment, I think specifically of two examples. One, of course, is, is the criminal justice system, right? The over-policing of black and brown people uh, created criminal records that shadow those folks and shadow those folks to this day, right? Um, and housing policies were instituted that would say, if you have a criminal record, you're not able to live in this community or receive this kind of housing support. So rather than overtly discriminating in housing on the basis of race, the discrimination is on the basis of of criminal background, which is nominally a non-racial category, but is in fact very, very racialized, as we all know. Um, and then also one issue that we're dealing with in the legislature right now is around what's called source of income discrimination. Uh, you know, so while it is illegal for a landlord to discriminate on, uh, against the tenant on the basis of race, um, they can discriminate on the basis of what's called source of income. So you can say, well, you know, if you're receiving your rental income through Section 8 through federal vouchers, housing support vouchers. Um, I don't want to have you here. I don't want a voucher payment. I want someone who can pay uh, through more traditional means. That kind of discrimination is perfectly legal in the state of Illinois. Uh, but of course, again, this is just another recoding of racism, right? Um, 
because of course those the recipients of those Section 8 vouchers are overwhelmingly black and brown. So it's just another sort of uh, legal facade for the same sort of institutional racism that was once explicit in, in law um, it's now sort of covered by through these other mechanisms. Um, so we have the, the work of integration um, is far from over, did not end in 1968 or anything. Uh, I mean, we can look in our communities I, in the city of Chicago, the city of Evanston, communities up and down the North Shore and see that the work of integration has not uh, really taken root in so many of our communities. Thank you both, Courtney and Will, uh, for those uh, great comments there. I'm gonna bring Robin into the, the conversation here and I have a question for you. Um, a large focus of Evanston's local reparations efforts involve housing. Why and how did addressing housing become a major focus today? Well, how is the community said so? So in 2019, when we began our road to reparations in Evanston, we led with a um, community process where stakeholders weighed in on what forms of reparations we would like to prioritize in Evanston. And overwhelmingly, there were recommendations related to housing, housing grants, access to home ownership, uh, tax abatements, uh, just the list went on and on and it was related to housing. And um, of course, we had to have a case for reparations. And thanks to your great work, Dino, um, everyone, please do learn more about our case for reparations. It's on our website, cityofevanston.org backslash reparations. But there we have um, still evidence of um, continued ongoing uh, racism that's embedded even in our policy today through zoning. Um, through different policies that restrict and limit the Black community from accessing opportunity outside of the historically Black community. And although fair housing was passed and redlining has been outlawed, the consequences of those uh, egregious acts against the Black community continue today. Um, the, the red line map is still our most concentrated Black community, our most concentrated poverty our most concentrated lack of uh, community amenities, no neighborhood school, no access to, um, to healthy foods, um, not a, a fair merchant district. So we continue to have the consequences of those laws and zonings today. And how we got there was, it was the case. There was evidence of plunder in the black community of wealth being stripped away through, uh, through anti-Black housing and zoning policies that's very well detailed in the report that Dino has provided. And our, our law department is very confident in our case to defend uh, reparations as it relates to housing. So it was led by our community. It's defended by um, the history of Evanston um, anti-Black policy and housing. And we are you know, very proud of our city to be prioritizing uh, reparation and leading with housing, it being um, the, the, the quickest way for any family, black or white, to um, develop wealth. It is going to create a sense of place for black families, is going to help sustain um, our black community that had been in an exodus. We are less than 17% of the population now, and we had been um, in the mid 20s before, and that's due to lack of uh, affordability, lack of a sense of place for black residents, and um, and, and lack of living wage jobs. So um, we have advanced it based on community voices and based on a viable legislative path, for, path to reparations and a, a case for reparations that will likely need to be defended. Thank you so much, Alderman Simmons, for that uh, those comments. Um, I have two questions left and they're actually addressed to the entire group. So anybody can chime in at any time. And, the first question of those two is, um, over the last 50 years, policies have been introduced to address these housing inequalities. What were some of the overall effectiveness in these policies or ineffectiveness? And anyway, I can jump in. <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll try to jump in. Um, I, I think I may be less knowledgeable about some of the policies, but I think everybody knows about the Fair Housing Act of 1968 um, that was signed by um, President, uh, then President Lyndon Baines Johnson. It was to try to address the inequities and discrimination uh, regarding housing as a 
sort of tribute to um, the, the life of Dr. King. Um, the effort to sign the bill came shortly after Dr. King's death. And, and, um, and as a result of that, I think that it was never really given a fair deal, Dino. I think that, that people thought that it was uh, just dressing up a situation. Um, and, and there was, uh, of course, we know a falling out between President Johnson and Dr. King uh, before his death anyway, in the year prior over the Vietnam War. So when I think about um, the kinds of acts that were were signed regarding housing, I wonder whether or not the majority of them were sort of dressed up to try to uh, give a public show that something was being done about the discrimination rather than doing the serious um, laborious work that it takes to investigate, to do the research, uh, the kind of work that you do, of course, with your organization. Um, I'm not so sure that was done at the federal level. Um, if, I, if I could just very quickly go back to something Courtney said, um, which I think is so important because, because he talked about he talked about discrimination and, and housing with regard to geographical pieces. And I want to quickly quickly share. Robin and I both lived in the Detroit area for a while. One of the things about Detroit that absolutely amazed me, it's a, it's a major, it was always a major city. When they decided um, to take away the impact of um, Black power in, in Detroit, and what I mean by that is really um, business um, presence and also an accumulation of wealth, um, they decided to destroy what was called the, 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 the Black the black community's business area. It was called Paradise Valley. Before that, it was called Black Bottom. So they had built this wonderful area on the Lower East Side of Detroit. And when um, when whites in Detroit recognized that that power base was growing like you wouldn't believe, they decided to end it by building highways, making um, the downtown area of Detroit accessible to that <laughs> Gate of whites who were leaving and going into the suburbs. So I think it's the only city I know of in the country that has six major highways crisscrossing through neighborhoods in the city of Detroit as a way to try to truncate and diminish uh, the powerful presence of Blacks when it came to business, when it came to homes. I think it thoroughly destroyed um, the aura and the beauty of, of Detroit, which at one time was one of the most powerful middle-class uh, regions in the entire country. So I just wanted to share that piece as well. Thank you. And Dino, I'll add that the failures um, from policy has, and, and Rep. Will and Courtney have really laid it out well already. And if you if you pass a um, housing policy, a fair housing policy, um, but you don't allow access to jobs or access to um, fair lending, then what have you really accomplished? And even if we come to a modern day contemporary legislation like inclusionary housing, so we have inclusionary housing, that's great. But if the average median income in the area is still not going to allow Black families to income qualify, then what have you done? You still have not created affordable housing stock for the Black community. Still today, we have uh, predatory lending practices and huge uh, discrepancies in the appraisal market. So that's stripping away wealth from the Black community. I have an example right here in the ward of a family between she and her husband's appraisals a white and black uh, couple, a hundred thousand dollar difference right here in Evanston on Emerson. And that's just in recent times. So until all of the institutional accomplices, including the financial markets, the mortgage lenders, the real estate industry, legislators work together on something reparative, uh, we're not going to make the, pro the progress that we need. And that includes the work that we're doing with reparations. So we hope that what we've done in Evanston has um, call the question and, and hold other institutions accountable for them to match our efforts. Thank you, Alderman Simmons. I, you know, I find out you know, what you just said in those comments. Oh, go ahead, uh, Representative. Oh, I just, uh, I have something I'd like to just add quickly, but I saw Courtney cut on your video, like you might be about to jump in there, so I don't want to step in front of you. Go right ahead. No, no, you go right ahead. <laughs> Just to say, um, say very briefly that uh, in terms of the policies that have succeeded or failed, I mean, uh, you know, I live in Chicago, so it's hard for me not to think about the plan for transformation, uh, the federal takeover of the Chicago Housing Authority in the 1990s, the destruction of Cabrini Green and the other uh, high rise public housing projects, um, which, you know, I think those, th that project was undertaken 
perhaps with good intentions, but the um, there has been no real delivery on the replacement of that high rise housing with meaningful affordable housing and communities for the people who used to live there. It's just been a sort of massive displacement project that's led to you know, huge new developments for wealthy developers in those communities that used to have the high rises on them where Cabrini Green used to be. If anyone knows this area, it's now like full of Whole Foods and ritzy condos. But um, the, the folks who were displaced never got the 25,000 units of affordable housing that CHA promised. Um, CJ has dried its feet, it's sat on its money, it's done very little uh, to address the tremendous crisis of homelessness and housing insecurity in Chicago. So, um, and, you know, I think a sort of unfortunate byproduct of the, the, the work of the legislative work of the civil rights movement is that, you know, we're not, uh, policy that's explicitly talked about race isn't, isn't legal anymore, but of course, the, the, the thing that prevents us from doing is talking explicitly about the need for remedies to racism, right? Um, the need for uh, explicitly uh, uh, racially targeted interventions to the communities that have been historically discriminated against. Um, and in housing, it's, it's, uh, it's true as, as much in housing as in any area. Um, but, you know, we, uh, our hands are in some ways tied by, uh, um, by some, of, some of the legislation and, and um, anti-discrimination efforts that we passed with the best of intentions um, are now in some ways preventing us from saying black people have been discriminated against in this country, black people need uh, specific uh, targeted interventions to, to improve their economic situation. Or I just sure you have anything you want to like to add anything? I, I personally think you all nailed it. The one thing I would add um, to everything is simply looking at how student loan has been an anchor around a lot of, you know, a lot of young Black millennials and just in the industry as a whole. Um, when you look at policy around taking the trades out of high schools, you know, you've kind of led a community of folks who through systemic racism, we see it in wage earning, that now folks are having to go on to college and be encumbered by a lot of student loan debt. And then now you come out and the jobs that folks are working aren't necessarily, not necessarily yielding the fruits that would allow folks to carry those student loan debts as well as still acquire the dream of home ownership. Uh, so when you look at some of these passive aggressive barriers, um, they, they're definitely impeding. And when you look at neighborhoods where 51 to 55% are made up of black families, the appraisal issue is becoming way more glaring because not only does it strip wealth from families, but it actually puts folks in negative, net negative when you purchase. So that prevents infrastructural scalability from businesses which tend to employ you know, 60 to 70 percent of the average neighborhoods. Thank you for that, uh, those comments there. Uh, we have a couple of questions in the Q&A, um, and I do see them. Um, and I think part of my last question to all of you will start to address some of these questions that uh, people are starting to uh, fill in the Q&A section. Um, and this last question is open to everyone on the panel here. How could cross collaborations and partnerships across sectors work toward remedies and housing discrimination? And I'm going to incorporate this with some of the comments here that uh, questions here that were in the Q&A. Um, uh, Carol mentions most of the communities on the North Shore fall well below the IDHA minimum of 10% affordable housing. How can this be changed? Uh, how can this be changed, the color of the North Shore become more diverse? And the additional question is, could you speak to the issue of remedies of redlining, uh, remedies for redlining and segregation? Should some of the remedies be aimed at enabling people to live outside of areas which they have been limited? So I think this all kind of kind of goes inside with the general question that I posed here. How could cross collaborations and partnerships across sectors work toward remedies and housing discrimination, incorporating those two other questions that uh, I had posed there as well. 
With everyone's permission, I'll take a stab at that. Um, collaboration, Dino, you know, is, is huge. When you take public officials who actually would be addressing the public policy piece of how certain bills like rent control impact neighborhoods where 65 to 68 percent of black neighborhoods are renter to owner and then you take into account that the average net worth of a renter is fifty five hundred dollars compared to two hundred and twenty five thousand of an owner right there's a policy piece that would be needed to start taking into account things like uh fico credit scoring modeling and how those models Dino are outdated. We need FICO 9 Advantage score that would take things into account like utility bills and, and how folks are managing their uh, cell phone and other things. And that simple flip of the switch makes more people credit eligible through the antiquated credit scoring modeling that they use. Then when you take things like buildings departments and department of planning and development and those commissions when those commissions are working with the advocated public policy now you can actually take those revenues that the cities and municipalities are, are receiving they can now start structuring things like what alderman robin simmons and all of you in support of with reparations those types of programs can have teeth because now you have these blighted properties or over encumbered properties with taxes that now can become less cumbersome for the average working class family. Okay, and then lastly, when you look at our um, clergy leadership, our trade association chambers and, and entities alike, now you have an environment where we can be promoting the different housing programs and initiatives that are being generated so that the congregants can actually get their spirituality growth at that faith center, as well as economic, you know, relief at that church center slash, you know, um, faith center. So I think there's a lot of cohesiveness that can actually be generated through collaboration. So, Dino, let me jump in here after uh, the good preacher, Courtney, just preached that wonderful sermon. <laughs> I want to say amen to that for sure, um, because I think he touched on everything. And, and there is no question in, in my mind that um, the, the question that was addressed that, that, you, that you posed, Dino, and others that were in the Q&A um, all reflect on the incredible and important need for networking. Um, the only way we are going to be able to address the continued discrimination in housing against people of color, against black and brown people, is if every community makes a concerted um, effort and decision proactively to, to network, to end the discrimination that's going on in that community. And that collaboration has to be um, inclusive of all of the sectors that make up a community. So I'm not, I'm not so sure that one has the capacity to do that at the national level, although it would be wonderful. I'm not so sure that one has the capacity yet to do it at the state level. And I think that would be wonderful. But when you look at what um, um, Alderman Robin has done in Evanston with reparations and with the collaboration and networking that has been built um, to create um, a, an environment that is literally anti-racist, that, that, that we are focused on ending every visible sign of public racism in, in Evanston, to me, that's the first step in being able to strike down um, these continued pernicious barriers um, that keep black and brown people away from home ownership. And when I think about the sectors that uh, were lifted up by, by Courtney talks about uh, the religious community, um, you also have to include other organizations like Evanston has. We, we in the black community call them the divine nine. Those are sororities and fraternities um, that, is that are historically black that are very, very important as well. We're also talking about um, things like the, the, the chamber of commerce in a community and how important um, businesses are and the role that they play in this effort. And, and of course, finally, the financial lending institutions. If you're an 
Evanston, you may also, if you're in a town like Evanston or Chicago, you can also draw on institutions of higher education. All of them need to come together to collaborate and use their skill set, their abilities, their talents, and their excellence to say, this is not, first of all, this is not going to happen in our community. And second of all, how can we create a, a community? that is actually as diverse and inclusive as the United States or as or as our region. It's going to be tough in the North Shore because in the North Shore moving beyond um, Evanston, you, you all know it gets wider and wider, you know, until you get to maybe Waukegan and that that whiteness has to do with wealth. And, and, and uh, I, I think that we have a right as black and brown people to be in that setting, to be in, in that property. Um, but we have to find a way to make that happen. And it's not going to happen until we have this fierce, powerful social justice advocacy that includes every single public sector working together, black and white and other. Awesome. I'm, I'm just going to jump in and add that uh, what we have to do is be more intentional to empower and less charity. Uh, less programming and subsidies and vouchers that still keep you dependent on a system and not able to re remove yourself from that subsidy because then you can't afford market rate. So it's less about um, a rush to get Black people to leave the Black neighborhood and get them in a white neighborhood and then we fix our problems here. It's more about empowering them. So to, to displace a, a Black family into a predominantly white neighborhood on a voucher that they are now dependent on a subsidy is not the type of empowerment that we need to see to restore our, our community to what we once were. There was a time before, um, before that our community had one of the highest rates of black home ownership in the nation in, in Evanston. We had a very thriving business community. Um, and we, we had you know, a black Y and a hospital, we had a school and we had you know, neighborhood grocery stores. And because those things were stripped away, it stripped away the wealth. So it's not so much, of course, we want to not have a segregated community because right now we're, we celebrate our diversity. We don't really talk about our segregation much that continues today, but it's more about empowering families um, with wealth and independence and not so much dependence on uh, subsidies and vouchers, but an opportunity to thrive and create our own way. I'll just add briefly a couple of points to say one, you know, I think, um, I think that there is value in stating that integration is an explicit policy goal, right, among policymakers that um, having, uh, you know, I think we talk about, uh, sorry, my camera is making all kinds of weird flashing lights. Um, we talk about ending segregation, but I think uh, rather than talking about it in a negative, I think it's important for us to talk about it in the affirmative as sort of creating the conditions for integration. Um, and uh, those conditions, the, the folks who spoke before me have spoken about them very eloquently. I think the sort of key point to me is that the, um, the economic devastation that's been wrought on the Black community, uh, the extraction of wealth and resources from the Black community uh, is intimately bound up in the housing crisis that's facing the Black community. Um, and that uh, housing related responses have to be connected to responses that do exactly what the Ottoman just said, you know, economic empowerment, right? Um, uh, raising wages, creating good jobs, uh, creating the opportunities for, for economic growth in the Black community have to go hand in hand with the sort of affordable housing uh, planning and policy making that we're doing. Um, to create, as, as the Ottoman put it so eloquently, you know, real conditions for real empowerment. Thank you for all of that. We have another question from the audience, and that was my last question. So this would be a great uh, time for anybody who may have additional questions um, to add them. I see actually three of them kind of popped in really quick. So uh, we have about I know we have, um, we stop at seven, but I think, uh, I think we're gonna start, maybe we go to 7.05. I just wanna make sure I'm respectful of people's times and, and patience with this, and um, we'll try and get through these quickly. Um, um, 
Jackie Eddy uh, um, asks, how can white Evanstonians support this work to ensure affordable housing is available in our communities and that practices of racial discrimination around housing are not tolerated? Yeah, let me tackle that uh, first, Dino. And I know this sounds awful and self-serving, but the one thing I would say that is available to uh, white Evanstonians is, um, is joining organizations like the NAACP the NAACP does have, uh, in Evanston, does have a housing committee that is focused and, and working on addressing these issues. It has some history. The organization, as you know better than anybody, started in 1918 and took a brief hiatus and started back in 1927. So they've been around for an awful long time. And I think that it's important um, for whites who have a desire to help in this area or in other areas that are focused on anti-racism to join an organization like um, the NAACP. There are certainly others in the community, but as we like to say in the ranks of the NAACP, we are the oldest and the boldest and the longest and the strongest. So uh, in terms of civil rights, we've been around for a long time. So um, I would say that's one thing they can do. Yeah. Yeah, can, can I uh, maybe put a, a finer point on that, that uh, to, to my fellow white people who uh, are asking these kinds of questions? And just to say what, what maybe the Reverend is being polite <laughs> uh, about, listen to black people. When black leaders tell you what their communities need, don't come through being smarter. Don't come through founding your own organizations, advancing your own ideas. Listen to the black leaders in your community. There are many of them. We had several of them on this panel this evening who were telling us the kinds of solutions that the Black community needs. Start from that place of humility and listening, please, to those white folks on this call who want to be helpful. Um, I really, I, I know it's the, the urge to come through with the answer, uh, hey, I got it, I came up with it, I know it'll help those Black folks. Please take a step back, listen, hear from the folks who are most affected by these policies and then try to support the work that they're doing. I think that's, uh, that's the best we can do. Thank you for that, Representative Will. Let me say, I didn't even think I had to say that. I thought that was a good <laughs> but I'm certainly, glad, I'm certainly glad you brought that up for sure. <laughs> it may seem like it should be a given, Reverend, but <laughs> it is not always, unfortunately. There is another question that we have here uh, from Tina. Uh, Reverend Neighbors said I should contact groups to get help with discrimination, uh, discrimination practices. Who should I contact to get help with the harassment of my family for over 30 years by the city of Evanston? Do you have some phone numbers and names? And maybe this is a bigger question for the entire group and as well as open communities as a service um, that brings, you know, these type of issues to light. I mean, before open communities, I mean, if I can briefly say, open communities has been around since what, 1972. It was under, this is the third naming iterations. They first started out as North Shore Interfaith Housing Council and then transferred to Interfaith Housing Center of the North Shore, Northern Suburbs, and now they're open communities. And they've been around for a while battling these things specifically. So uh, I'll pass it back to you, uh, Reverend Neighbors, but also I think it's a good opportunity for open communities to probably pop in and make a few comments as well. Yeah, th thank you so much, Dino. And yes, obviously I see that Mary Ellen um, wrote in the chat box, one of the first uh, groups to call is Open Communities because that's the work that they do. And they, and they do have a 50 year history in the Evanston community for that. Um, I would also encourage folks, um, if they believe that they've been discriminated against, to call the NAACP and there's a legal redress committee that seeks to um, uh, receive complaints of discrimination. Some paperwork to be filled out, but that's another group. Uh, and then, of course, if it's the city of Evanston, um, I, I would say going straight to members of um, your city council and your older person and making uh, that complaint known to them as well and finding different ways, multiple ways to be able to address your issue. And I'm just going to do the plug for open community because I'd be a terrible CEO if I didn't. But uh, our phone number is, and just you can also Google us, open-communities.org. Our phone number is 847-501-5760. Um, 
info at open communities will get you to the right person. We are here for this exact reason. We do a ton of education for landlords, for renters, for homeowners. We're here for the entire part of it. And if I am not a panelist, but I just wanted to jump in because this, this discussion has been so amazing. And when we, yeah, when we get the questions about what, what can white folks do, right? And um, we've touched upon it. So it, it, the thing is, it, it's, I think a lot of it is listen and then believe the stories. So I, I go everywhere and I talk about the things that we see and the calls that we get and the folks that we're helping. And people are like, no not in 2021, not in the North Shore, we are and not in Evanston, because we are so loving and inclusive and welcoming. Absolutely not. I mean, we are those things, but there's many, many issues. So when, when folks talk about their experience, their experience is valid and it's actually real, and things are a lot sneakier than you would ever mean. And by, by that I mean, and it came up tonight, it's the not sexy things. It's not like the building of the big, beautiful buildings. It's, it's zoning. It's credit scores, it's student loans, it's appraisals as we were talking about. These, those things might seem um, on the periphery or not a huge deal, but th they are the foundation of everything that we're talking about. So I think that's critical. Um, and if I could just do another plug for white folks in the world as, as we become an anti-racist organization. I am a white person that's leading an organization as we try to become anti-racist and we will be racist until we are anti-racist and it will be, it will change every day, right? We have to, it's a continual struggle of, of learning and moving forward as being an anti-racist organization. And as an organization, we are committed to telling the stories, no longer using stories because nonprofits use stories and, and, and elected representatives use stories to talk about the impact of some of these policies. And I think historically we use our stories and um, we talk about the poor person that eventually pulled themselves up by the bootstraps and then became successful. And we as an organization have, have made a very conscious effort to stop capitalizing on black trauma in our stories and start talking not about the people that this is impacting, but by the, the policies and the systems that are keeping folks down. So when we talk about our clients and their amazing um, their amazing route into empowerment or, or uh, getting a new home or doing any of those things. It's not like, oh, they picked themselves up by the bootstraps and they bought that house. It is, they fought against a systemic racist system. And with our help, they, they did this. What, we didn't do this. They work against the system. We no longer are like, oh, they did it with our help. No, we're fighting the big fight. So when we talk about our stories, that's we are, we're flipping the script to a story of abundance, not scarcity. We're talking about empowering. We're not talking about victims. Um, and the last thing I think we really want to say is, is I, I, I get very angry when people talk about like giving a voice to the voiceless. And the last time I checked, no one's voiceless. They're just not listened to. So no longer do we talk about our clients' stories as we gave them a voice or we we, we just let them speak and then we amplified their voice. We stopped talking. So on that note, I'm gonna stop talking, but thank you. I wanna just say thank you. I know we're coming up to the end, but I just had to plug open communities um, and the work that we're doing. So that's how you can help also help support. I think also in the, uh, the, the Q and A, um, one member uh, mentioned too for other additional resources and assistance. Think about your local public library. There are a wealth of information. Librarians have uh, like this collective wealth of a lot of different aspects of information, where to get things, how to look things up, where to find the resources, the contacts. They can guide you to a lot of different things. And you know, for me personally, all of this has spoke very well to me because I'm actually in the middle of refinancing my home. And some of these things just popped up today. I'm like, I have to get, how, why is it so difficult to get a refi if I'm paying this, but you have to fit these guidelines so I can refinance that if I don't meet that, I am disqualified for, but I'm doing it right now. So what is the difference? So, I mean, just looking at the, how deep the policies go and following federal guidelines. I mean, we have to look at federal guidelines to change. We have to look at how the, that helps shape what banks are doing, how that has to change to uh, meet new criteria, how inspectors are, um, have to change and how there's a unified 
system of evaluating homes, how the vestiges of, um, of redlining still informs banks and lenders and real estate agents of how to, in, in cities, of how to invest in a community. So it's not like the um, families that live in redlined areas want to leave the area. Um, the builds wealth to their own homes, that they live there. So that, I mean, just living this experience again, I'm so um, happy that we had this conversation, especially tonight, because I've been speaking to our, our lenders late and um, not too happy. Yeah. Yeah, Dino, let me share very quickly that another very valuable source in Evanston, uh, which may be one of the most valuable resources we have, um, is, uh, is Shorefront. And I think that Dino's humility might prevent him from talking about um, there being um, a potential source that folks can reach out to um, to receive important historical data and information, but also just general advice um, about where to go and how to go up out dealing with particular situations. So they are one of the strongest and most able um, Black organizations that we have um, in Evanston. And I, I think that we would be remiss if we did not uh, mention that. And again, propriety would probably uh, prevent uh, Dino from saying that I have no shame in plugging the NAACP though. So I got to plug, <laughs> I got to plug Dino and his organization as well, for sure. Yeah. Thank you so much for doing that. Yes, I do kind of feel that my board president gets on me all the time about not um, failing to plug myself enough in these situations. So thank you. And I want to thank all of our panelists uh, tonight. Um, Alderman Robert Simmons, Representative Will Guzardi, um, um, Reverend Michael Neighbors, and uh, Courtney Jones, who had, I, I think he had dropped off a bit, as well as the staff and um, organizers at Open Communities for hosting this and bringing to light um, uh, this, this important discussion that we have. Um, actually, I'm putting in, I'm trying to type and talk at the same time, which is never a good thing to do. So <laughs> I'm just plugging in uh, Shorefront's website address if you'd like to see that. Um, I, I, I encourage everyone to explore what Open Communities have to offer. Open Communities was responsible for a lawsuit against two real estate agencies uh, in the late 1980s, early 1990s that um, caused one of them to close down because of uh, discriminatory housing practices. So this is a strong organization that really means what they talk about. They're advocating and providing voices that are no, um, sometimes not heard and trying to correct a lot of things that happened in the past. So appreciate the work that you do. And um, for all of you panelists, if you want to say any final words before we sign off, uh, feel free to do so. Thank you again um, to Open Communities for everything that you've done. And to the community asking, what can you do? Just do what you can with what you have now, but do something. It doesn't have to be groundbreaking. Small steps, incremental steps are necessary um, and you can build on them. And then also make sure that you're having these conversations in rooms that we're not in, in communities that are not yet enlightened or informed. Um, but please do um, continue to be an ally leader. And thank you for that question. And Dino, thank you so much for moderating tonight. And Mary Ellen, thank you for hosting us through Open Communities. I would say what um, I have learned through the words of the late Benjamin E. Mays, who was the president of Morehouse College for many years, he would end every single commencement year in and year out with the urgency of the moment by saying, I own only have a minute, only 60 seconds in it. Forced upon me, didn't use it. I must suffer if I lose it, give account if I abuse it. Only a tiny little minute, but eternity is in it. So take advantage of this moment now. I wanna say thank you. Thank you to everybody. Thank you for taking time out of your night on another Zoom that no one wants to be on anymore. So thank you for your faces and your commitment and coming in and sharing and listening. Um, I am beyond grateful. And this panel is just a force and I'm so happy that they're in the world and I get to know them. So thank you.
I'm still muted. And thank you everyone for tonight. Um, and have a great evening. Um, I think I'm gonna get some dinner now before I pass out. <laughs> Thanks everyone.